Now we've got the U.S. Senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders. Thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. So Republicans are moving in a number of states from Idaho to Texas to suppress voting for young people. They're trying to ban on-campus voting. They're trying to prevent student IDs from being an acceptable form of ID at the polling place. If anyone would understand the importance of young people speaking out politically, it's you. So what's your response to these Republicans who are trying to prevent young people from exercising their rights to vote? It is unspeakable. It really is. It's outrageous. It's an effort to undermine democracy. And it tells us how shallow the entire Republican ideology is. Look, Brian, I don't mind if people disagree with each other, you disagree with me, that's called democracy. But if the only way you're going to win an election is to deny people the right to vote, it tells me that you got nothing real to say. So making it harder for young people who are the future of this country, who are facing enormous problems today in terms of student debt, the high cost of college, in terms of worries about uh, childcare for their kids or student debt, To say to those kids, we don't want you to participate because you're going to vote against us is absolutely disgraceful. And this should send a message to young people. If they don't want you to vote, what you got to do is radically increase voter participation. Do everything you can to bring your friends to the polls. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Like if you didn't understand the importance of your vote now, the fact that they're trying so desperately hard to take it away should be a testament to how potent, how powerful it is. You know, this reminds me a little bit about the kind of racism that we have has existed in this country for so many years. And many people in the black community have responded exactly appropriately. They don't want us to vote. You know what we're going to do? We're going to increase voter turnout. That should be the message. Now, a Republican operative lawyer named Cleta, uh, Cleta Mitchell was caught on tape speaking to a bunch of bigwigs at the RNC about the ways that they're going to use to try to prevent young people from voting. This woman was on the call between Trump and Brad Raffensperger, where he was pressuring him to find 11,780 votes that didn't exist. What does it say that the GOP is still being led right now to this day by the same purveyors of the big lie? What it says is that increasingly, not 100 percent, but increasingly, we have a major political party that doesn't believe in democracy. So it's one thing is, you know, for a party to hold an ideology, a conservative ideology. That's one thing. Let's debate that. But it's another thing for a party to simply say we have to win at all costs, even if it perpetuates a big lie even if it involves making it impossible for people who vote against us to vote. No, I I completely agree. Now, we've got a Supreme Court right now moving over to that issue that is completely insulated from any sense of accountability or ethics. What do you support in terms of court reforms from, you know, uh, court expansion or term limits or a code of ethics or something else? Well, I think I'm not a great fan of packing the Supreme Court because it it really will make the, the court an entire joke. Uh, which is really what goes on in Wisconsin right now. I mean, it is totally political, and that's it raises a whole broader issue of the role of judiciary in American society. Because simply, when Democrats come to power, you add five more judges. Republicans come and you add more. You're going to end up with 800 people on the Supreme Court. Uh, but I do think the there is a way to rotate judges, which is consistent with the Constitution. And that would be, I think, a preferable approach. And what do you think the likelihood of of getting something like that through would be? I think people are looking, sadly enough, I think people are now seeing the Supreme Court not as a group of nine people who seriously look at precedent and constitutional law, but really as a political body where you now have, you know, say five Republicans, three Democrats and one somewhere in the middle. Uh, And that's really not what it should it should be. Uh, so, you know, I think we need to take a hard. And the other thing, obviously, is what Judge Thomas has, uh, what we've seen recently in in, in uh, his financial uh, situation. Uh, we need to, to have strong ethical standards in the Supreme Court, which does not exist right now. Just as a quick aside on the Clarence Thomas thing, you know, his benefactor, I guess we'll call him Harlan Crow, is had claimed that he has Nazi memorabilia, including a signed copy of Mein Kampf, because uh, because it's important to remember travesties that have happened in the past. 
we're both Jewish. I'm assuming that we had similar reactions to this. What was your reaction when you when you heard that? Well, a reaction is it goes beyond this particular individual. It goes beyond a Supreme. It goes to a Supreme Court justice, justice who is being funded by an extreme right wing person, and uh, that should not be acceptable. It really shouldn't. There are laws that other judges have got to abide by, and that should be apply applicable to the uh, Supreme Court. So let's get into the economic stuff here. You've spoken out in favor of a four-day work week. That's a 32-hour work week to replace a 40-hour work week. What's the pitch for that? All right, here's the story, Brian, and thanks for asking that question. Let me be very clear, and I think very few people will disagree with me. As a result of artificial intelligence and robotics, there is going to be a radical transformation of our economy and our workplaces, all right? The jobs that many people have today will not be there 15, 20, 30 years from uh, now. And that's not just blue collar workers, that's white collar jobs as well. So there are a couple of things. I think, first of all, the main point to be made is that technology unto itself is not necessarily bad. If you even come up with machinery that makes workers more productive, that eliminates uh, filthy work or work of drudgery, that's a good thing. Who should benefit from that technology? Should it just be the people who own the technology or the corporations who utilize it, or should it be the workers themselves? So if we can, and I think we should be discussing reducing the work week to 32 hours as a result of increased productivity, that is what we have got to do. Second point, The more complicated point, then I'll, is this. Uh, What we are seeing in not just robotics, but in artificial intelligence is an exponential growth in the kind of information uh, computers now can assemble. Uh, And there are some very serious people, and this is not science fiction. There are some very serious people who worry that that artificial intelligence may outsmart, if you like, the human developers of that technology, that they will act independently of human wishes, in which case you're into a potentially very weird uh, future. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are some of the issues I think we've got to look at in in that area. On on that point, you know, if 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 American companies are going to benefit from the effects of AI and increased automation, presumably other countries would do the same. So is there any worry that that scaling back to a four day work week would kind of put it put us at a strategic disadvantage relative to other countries who may not adopt the same four day work week, but who have the same advantages uh, that are presented by by this, you know, by these advances in technology? I think all over the world unions and and uh, working people are talking about a, a, a four-day work week. Uh, in the UK, for example, there was recently uh, a study done by a number of companies who implement, implemented a four-day work week. And look, what they found, you know, if you're going to, if you go to work, what's important is not the number of hours you sit at a desk, it's what you accomplish. And what a number of studies have shown is that when people have more time off, more time off for leisure, being with their families, entertainment, they end up being more productive. So what I think many of these companies found, actually, workers produced more and felt better about their jobs after 32 hours rather than 40 hours. Moving over to the budget, Kevin McCarthy finally released this Republican budget, which effectively dismantles the Inflation Reduction Act. It cancels IRS funding, it cancels student loan debt forgiveness, and it increases oil and gas production. This thing has no chance of passing the Senate, and yet this gimmick is being done at a time where we got to move because the stability of the economy is at stake here. So what's your response to Kevin McCarthy, who seems to be perfectly content to just screw around here for partisan political game. Well, I think the the answer is, as you've suggest, this is an absurd, reactionary, dangerous approach. It goes without saying that we cannot uh, default on our debt, much of which, by the way, was accumulated during the Trump administration. Okay, so it is totally irresponsible for anybody to suggest that we not pay our bills and bring our country and the world into a major economic downturn. 
Uh, second of all, I think the antidote to what McCarthy is talking about is to come up with a budget and a set of principles which make sense to ordinary Americans. For example, Republicans talk all the time about their concerns about the national debt. That's part of what McCarthy is talking about. Well, if you're concerned about the national debt, you got to deal with income and wealth inequality. You got to demand that the wealthiest people and largest corporations stop paying their fair share of taxes. Second of all, you got to deal with the concerns, the enormous concerns that working people now have. What we're seeing now is millions of our people continue to work for starvation wages. And unbelievably, in the richest country on earth, we don't talk about this enough, Ryan, over 60% of Americans are still living paycheck to paycheck. All right. So what does that mean? It means you got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage. I'm chairman of the committee that has jurisdiction over that. I believe the minimum wage in this country should be $17 an hour. All right. You got to make it easier for workers to join unions, not make it harder. It's an issue we're working on in terms of Starbucks, Amazon, and other companies as well. Now, I do want to jump over to the minimum wage for a moment, but just first on this issue more broadly of Kevin McCarthy's budget, you know, he's being led on on a, on a leash basically by the most extreme members of his caucus who are responsible for putting him in the position that he's in right now. Is there any acknowledgement from your Republican colleagues in the Senate about the disaster that he's pushing everybody toward in this country by virtue of kowtowing to the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the party? Because it doesn't well, seem like Senate think... Republicans are, are on board the way that House Republicans are. Well, I think, you know, I don't want to speak for Republicans in, in the Senate. Uh, but I think some of them, at least, essentially ignore uh, what goes on in the House uh, and do their own thing. Uh, but your point is well taken that right now you have right wing extremists who are exerting enormous power uh, in the U.S. House. Now, the issue you just mentioned I want to go back to is uh, the issue of raising the minimum wage. You also wrote an op ed in The Guardian advocating uh, for that. The pushback that I presume you're going to get is that in certain states, um, well, first of all, Republicans are claiming that this should be a state's issue and that in certain states where the cost of living is so low, raising the wage higher than it is right now would make it untenable for companies that operate there. So what do you say in response to that? What I say is that there have been a number of studies which suggest that it's just not accurate. Uh, bottom line is, I don't care what state you are living in. And obviously, if you live in San Francisco or New York, the cost of living is higher than in rural West Virginia. That's true. Uh, but the bottom line is nobody in America can survive on seven and a quarter an hour. I don't care where you're living and nobody can survive on nine or ten dollars an hour. Uh, inflation has taken a toll in terms of housing costs, in terms of food costs, in terms of health care costs. And people need a living wage. Seventeen dollars an hour is not some kind of uh, outrageous number. It is, in fact, at the very least what people need to live with dignity. Uh, and enjoy a decent standard of living. Uh, all over this country, what we are seeing is an explosion in the cost of housing. People can't afford their rent. You've got many people paying 50% of their limited income for rent. People can't afford uh, the cost of food. Uh, and meanwhile, we have not raised the minimum wage in Congress since 2008. So the time is now for a significant increase in the minimum wage. Why is there no acknowledgement from those on the right that when you give people, uh, regular people, more disposable income by virtue of raising their wage, they'll be able to actually use that to stimulate the economy, which at the end of the day does benefit those you are assuming owners. You are assuming that we're looking at a rational debate. Yeah. Uh, so your point is if you put money into the hands of working people, they will use that money they will spend that money they have to uh, to stay alive, and that will in improve the economy. And I agree with you. Uh, look, the what you have right now, which takes us to a corrupt political system, is you have many members of Congress who receive a lot of their campaign contributions and their ideological uh, background from very, very wealthy people. And essentially what they think is that we have to work to improve life for the very, very wealthy. And really, if anybody is poor or any working class people are struggling, it's their fault. You stand up on your own. We need tax breaks for billionaires. And one of the issues that we're working on right now is you got 41 Republicans, that's 
of the over 80% of the Republicans in the Senate want to repeal the estate tax. Do you know who benefits from repealing the estate tax? Not the poor people. One half of 1%. So they want to give a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the top one half of 1%. What's the economic or moral justification for that? There is none. It just yeah. makes the rich richer. So to answer your question, this is not a rational argument. What you have right now is massive income and wealth inequality. Billionaires fund the political system. And you got a lot of people who are working for the rich who could care less about the working class and middle class of this country. Another issue that I mentioned before in terms of what Republicans are looking to repeal with their new budget is IRS funding. They keep claiming that it's important to repeal this because, you know, the IRS is out there knocking down doors and, and ripping the wallets out of hands of, of working class Americans. What has the IRS actually been able to do with its increased funding just, just this last tax season alone? Well, there are two or three areas that uh, the IRS has needed to improve upon. First of all, their service, if they're under service, they're a large bureaucracy. And if you don't have the people there to respond to your calls, you got a question, right, about your your tax form, right? You want to know what's legal, what's not legal. You make a telephone call. Well, if there's nobody hired at the other end, you're going to be in a lot of trouble trying to fill out your form. Or you're going to take hours to do what should take minutes. That's one issue. We need to fill those slots. The second broader issue, which really is what the Republicans worry about, is if you're a large corporation and you have all kinds of accountants and all kinds of lawyers helping you evade the tax law, how is the IRS going to compete with a dozen accountants who are you know, paid millions of dollars a year? All right. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that the IRS has a team of lawyers who can stand up to large corporations and their accountants and lawyers and say, you know what, you got to stop paying your fair share of taxes. That's really what the Republicans worry about. Just so that we have this this clip here, can you briefly explain what is at stake if Republicans do fail to lift the debt ceiling? Well, what it means is that, uh, you know, if, if you do not pay your debt, uh, you go bankrupt, right, as a person. What you're talking about is the United States then acknowledging to the entire world that we're incapable of paying our debts. If you like, we are bankrupt. Uh, we are um, defaulting on our debt. And if the United States, the largest economy on earth, uh, cannot pay its debt, clearly it will cause incredible chaos in the entire world's financial system. Investments will be significantly scaled back. It will mean increased unemployment uh, and economic chaos in our country and all over the world. And that is that is why people like Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump acknowledge that you cannot default on your debt. It would also seem to be at odds with the stated Republican goal of trying to protect our economy uh, if you then let the global economy melt down to try to, you know, to try to win this standoff. Uh, nobody denies that it would be uh, incredibly irresponsible, incredibly, and cause massive uh, damage. Uh, where we are right now uh, is that we need to mount an offensive against a right-wing ideology, which is at war with the working families of this country. And one of the issues that we are working on, the many issues that we're working on, on the Health Education Labor Committee, is to take on the pharmaceutical industry so that we significantly lower the cost of prescription drugs. We're going to deal with the child care crisis in America. You talk about the economy. Well, you know what? You can't go out and get a job if you have a child or two children at home and you can't find any child care. So we have a dysfunctional child care system, which we've got to deal with. In terms of health care, we have got to ask why we are spending twice as much per capita on health care as the people of any other country, and yet we have 85 million people who are uninsured or underinsured. Meanwhile, the drug companies and the insurance companies make record-breaking profits. So what our goal is right now, Brian, is to rally working-class people all over this country around an agenda that works for them and do everything we can to address this massive movement toward oligarchy and income and wealth inequality. And there's some good news out there. Let me give you some examples. Uh, you may recall that a number of months ago, a rail workers came before Congress and said, hey, we do difficult work. We have zero paid sick days, right? Well, you know what happened as a result of the work that the unions did and many of us in Congress did? 
We are right now, half the workers have seven days, and I expect within a couple of more uh, weeks or months, all of those workers and the unions will have gotten seven days uh, paid sick leave. Uh, we are also working with on university campuses where you have adjunct professors and graduate students who are really doing a lot of teaching and research and are being exploited. You may have noticed University of California last month had a huge strike. They won, those workers won that strike. Rutgers University, huge strike. They won their strike. It's a strike going on now at the University of Michigan. All of that is working people standing up for decent wages and benefits, and we are doing our best to support those efforts. Yeah, and I would also point out that Michigan was able to repeal its right to work law for the first time, the only state to be able to do that in the last 58 years. So that's some good move on the union front. Um, just building on that union topic for a moment, you know, we've seen, especially with these recent hearings where Howard Schultz came before uh, before the committee, um, basically that these anti-union CEOs are moving to basically violate union law in this country because there's no enforcement mechanism within the National Labor Relations Board. Is anything being done to bolster yep. enforcement so that when there are these violations, it's not just tacked up to a cost of doing business? Uh, you're exactly things? right. No, Brian, you're exactly right. That's a very important issue. Workers have the constitutional right to form a union. And what we're seeing in America today is more and more workers are exercising that right. They want to form unions. We're seeing that at Starbucks. We're seeing it on college campuses. We're seeing in white collar jobs, et cetera. What companies like Starbucks are doing, as you indicate, they are quite clearly breaking the law. You want to form a union? Well, guess what? We ain't going to negotiate a contract with you. We don't care what you want. We're going to break the law. So that's why I had Howard Schultz come before the committee to explain what he is doing. And we are continuing to work on that issue uh, in telling Starbucks they have to obey of the law. But more importantly, uh, to your point, and that is that we need teeth in labor law to say to the Starbucks and the Amazons and the other companies, guess what? You cannot do A, B, C, D. And if you do it, there's going to be substantial fines attached to your efforts. Right now, many of these companies are breaking the law with impunity. We have legislation called the PRO Act, uh, which is essentially uh, legislation which gives worker protects workers' rights to organize and tells companies they cannot interfere illegally with those rights. And I'm assuming the fate of that bill rests solely uh, uh, on whether we're able to get Democratic majorities in the House and Senate. That is exactly right. So if you're a worker out there and you're thinking politics is not relevant to your right to your uh, to your life, you want to form a union. Uh, I think we have virtually vir all of the Democratic senators maybe not one or two, but I think we have virtually all of them. I think we have zero Republicans on uh, supporting that legislation. But if we're going to grow the middle class in America, we got to grow the trade union movement. Uh, and that legislation is part of that effort. Let's finish off with this. Uh, there seems to be something of a push to legitimize bagels in DC. There is now uh, something called the Bagel Caucus. You're from Brooklyn. My whole family's from Brooklyn. We spoke about that before we started recording. I feel like it's something of of a birthright to be able to identify good bagels having come from uh, having come from there. Are you buying this effort, uh, this effort to claim that D.C. bagels are are actually good or as good as New York bagels? <laughs> I'm a big fan of bagels. Actually, I don't eat bagels very much in uh, in Washington, as I recall. Most yeah. of my bagels here are in Vermont, and I got to tell you, Vermont has moved a whole lot in recent years in terms of producing good bagels. So. If you're in Vermont, get one. Oh man, this turned this turned into a. I tried to bash DC bagels, and you had you started advocating for Vermont bagels hey, instead. Hey, I am Vermont senator, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fair enough. All right, well, Senator Sanders, thank you so much for taking the time. It's always great speaking to you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.